Good morning. It is good to see you here this morning. Welcome to worship at First Baptist Church. Hello to all those who are in the sanctuary. We say a special hello to those who are joining us online this morning. Welcome. Before we get started in the service, just would like to bring your attention on a few announcements which you can find on the insert of your order of worship. First is our Wednesday evening activities. We'll be right here on Wednesday night, November the 8th. You can see the list of the happenings and what we're going to be serving that evening. It looks like breakfast for dinner, one of my favorites. So please come and join us. Um, and you see the Bible studies as we continue to go through the commands of Jesus. On Thursday, November the 16th, our senior adult luncheon, you can see everything you need to know there. Uh, we just need you to make a reservation by November the 13th. So please, please do that if you can be in attendance. Our annual White Christmas is, head, is going to be here soon, Saturday, December the 9th. You see, again, information given to you there. Uh, there is a sign-up, or there has been a sign-up outside this door to my left in the hallway here. If you can help out any way, please let us know, and we will be glad to have you help us. Uh, there are some needs for our clothes closets, uh, particularly children's clothes, sizes newborn, all the way up to teen. If you can help in any way, please bring those by. You can leave them just inside the door off the parking lot for us, and we will get those to where they need to go. And I believe that we have a meeting today. Is Elizabeth here? And we have a meeting for our Greece mission team right after the, the worship service in Adams Hall. So if you're headed to Greece with us this next summer, Please meet us in Adams Hall, and we will have a short meeting to discuss whatever Elizabeth's going to talk to us about. So <clears throat> it is a good day. I uh, congratulate you on setting your clocks right. And uh, what did you say? Extra hour of preaching. That's right. You get an extra hour of preaching today. So there you go. <clears throat> All right. Let us worship. <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to his greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your power. All your works praise you, Lord, and your faithful servants bless you. They make, they make known the, the glory of your kingdom and, and speak of your power. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. Let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. We shall bless his holy name forever. Glorious is thy name, O Lord. Let us worship God. God, you are so worthy of our praise. Thank you for the blessings you give us each day, for the beauty of creation, family, friends, and most especially your mercy and grace. Help us to set aside uh, during this hour our worries, our cares, um, to give ourselves fully to you, to worship and adore you. And we pray together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And also with you. Let me add my welcome to First Baptist Church this morning, both those who are in our sanctuary, those with us online. We apologize for those who worship with us online. We've been off with some internet troubles the last couple of weeks, but we hope we're back up and going. That's a very important part of our worship, to have you with us as well. If you're in the sanctuary, don't forget to take the blue book that's on the inside of the aisle and fill that out and pass it down at some point during the service. But for right now, we want to turn and greet one another in the name of Christ. Would you please join us? that no one could count from every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb robed in white with palm branches in their hands they cried out in a loud voice saying salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the lamb sisters and brothers in Christ today our joy our voices join this ongoing heavenly praise. Let us remember those who have lived, worked, spoken, and witnessed to our faith. On this All Saints Sunday, we remember those who've gone to be with the Lord since this time last year. As each name is read and the bell is tolled, I'd invite you, if you were a friend or relative of these persons, to stand in their honor. Joanne Alexander. John Garland. Charles Guy.
Audrey Higgins. Sylvia Jolly. Danny Steichleather. Kenneth White. Sylvia Williams. Thank you. Please join me in the litany of remembrance. Almighty God, we give you thanks for these, your servants, whom we remember today. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your faithful servants. Give us faith to look beyond touch and sight so that we may see we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your faithful servants. Enable us to run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your faithful servants. Let us live as those who have lived before us. Let us live as one who has been forgiven and now lives with Christ. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your faithful servants.
Would you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, on this All Saints Day, we come to thank you for each saint that has been a part of our lives, for those who live faithfully in front of us and with us, who encouraged us day by day, who set an example of love and grace. We give you thanks. As we remember these whose names have been read, we remember their laughter. We remember the songs we sang together. We remember times of grief we walked together. And now, O oh Father, as we grieve them, we pray that you will walk with us, that anything that is left unresolved in this life, O oh Lord, your grace might come, your grace might remove that. And, O oh Father, all the good that has been done in this life, your grace might also bring to our remembrance those days of laughter, those times of love, all that we have shared, Father. Help us to remember. Help us to learn. But most of all, O oh Father, help us to remember the faith that they had, that faith that now lives on in us because they told us of their Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, and he brought to them salvation. And they are before his throne even now singing his praises. Help us, O oh Lord, to also sing your praises this morning. Help us to know that we are never alone, for your peace is upon us. Your grace is with us. Your love and mercy surround us. Hold us, O oh Lord, in the midst of our grief. Help us, O oh Father, to know which steps to take next, how to move forward in this life, how to live as your saints who continue in this place, that we too, O oh Lord, might one day be honored, that our memories, O oh Father, that those who think of us might be a blessing to all we have encountered. Forgive us when we fail you in these matters, O oh Father. Strengthen us. Help us to be resolute for the living of these days. In Christ's holy name, amen. Would you please stand?
Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we are so very grateful for all the many blessings you have bestowed upon us. And we now take this opportunity to return a portion for the furtherance of your kingdom. Help us to use these gifts to bless others in need, to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and comfort the sick. But most importantly, help us to show the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, to all we meet. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and the forgiveness of our sins through our belief in him. In your name we pray. Amen.
of God's word. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you preach long enough, you will say something stupid. I've done it more than once. The strange thing is, I don't even have to be preaching to say stupid things. I can just say them in everyday life. I remember several years ago, I was making a hospital visit, and I was visiting a woman who, she made me nervous, to be honest. In fact, she kind of made everybody nervous. She was a retired school teacher. She was one of those teachers that could just give you a look, and you just wanted to confess something even if you didn't do it. She, she just had that look about her, and she would make you nervous. She also had this extremely dry sense of humor, something that I came to really appreciate later on in life, and I actually learned that she was a very fun person. She became one of my favorite people, but at this time, I did not know her well, and I went to see her, and she was going to have surgery, and we were back in this little holding room, and waiting for the nurses to come and to get her to take her for surgery and they came and we had a prayer and then she and our husband and our her husband and i stepped on the other side of the curtain to go out and i turned around and for some stupid reason i said see you on the other side <laughs> to which she quickly replied other side of what preacher I was like, the, the, the curtain? <laughs> the door? I, I, what I meant is I'll be waiting with your husband out in the waiting room. Well, I was there when she came to and they brought her to her room and she said, so this is the other side. <laughs> I never lived it down. She never let me forget it. She got that in about every chance she got. When I said see you on the side, of course she thought, I was talking about death. That's what we usually mean when we say the other side. We have all kinds of euphemisms for death. People have passed over or they are simply asleep, but we often talk about people being on the other side, and I don't think that's a euphemism because I think they literally have gone to another side, to a different place that we do not see. When I stand before a graveside at a funeral service, I often will say, what you see here is not all there is. We must look with eyes of faith and see them in the hands of God. Bishop Brent wrote in his poem, The Ship, he says, what is dying? I am standing on the seashore and a ship sails in the morning breeze and starts for the ocean. She is an object of beauty, and I stand watching her till at last she fades on the horizon 
And someone at my side says, she is gone. Gone where? Gone from my sight is all. She is just as large in the mast, hull and spars as she was when I saw her, and just as able to bear her load of living freight to its destination. The diminished size and total loss of sight is in me, not in her. And just at that moment, when someone at my side says, she is gone, there are others who are watching her coming, and other voices take up a loud shout. There she comes. That is dying. We pass one, run, one reality into the next. The good news about death is there is something more. We go to the other side. But it's not just the other side of death. It is also the other side of the pain and trials of this world. John writes here in the Revelation a picture of what it is like to be in God's glory. There are people around the throne praising God, and John says, who are these people? And the answer comes back, they are these who have come out of the great tribulation. Now, don't get too tied up in various views of Revelation and the dispensations and the millennials and all of that. That is all pretty relatively recent in history. When John is writing, he is writing of a revelation that is meant to give the people of God hope in a time of tribulation, a time when they are being killed. He wants them to know that the saints who have gone on to be with the Lord have moved past this time of trial and tribulation, and they are now at perfect peace. They are standing before God, singing praises. We too will have that day. I could tell when I started getting a little older, when my conversations changed. I, I used to kid older people about that all they ever talked about were their aches and pains. And now, yep, I've joined in with them. And, and I know why we who are older do this, because we hurt. <laughs> because it's right on the front of our minds, because it's in our bodies. And as we all age, this is a part of it. But there's more than just that, isn't there? We have seen those whom we love go through great trials. We have seen people suffer. But we know that on the other side, there is no suffering. Whatever travail there is in this world, it is instantly over. And they are in God's loving presence. And that is the other side. That is good news. What is it over there on the other side? Well, God is on the other side. Revelation paints the picture of God on the throne and the Lamb, Jesus, there. Heaven is about the completeness of God, about God being in perfect control and all of us being in God's loving presence. We see this from time to time, even on this side. Sometimes when I've been on mission trips, at the end of each evening, we'll be asked, where did you see God today? Some people call these God sightings. When did you have that feeling of God's presence? When did you see God break through into this world and do something? Maybe you saw a rainbow or a sunset or you were standing before the mountains or the sea and you just were overwhelmed with God's greatness. One person on one of these trips said that they had seen an Afrin Jacana bird. That is a bird that is very interesting. When the chicks are born, the father takes over caring for them. And if a predator approaches, he makes loud noises and he calls them. And then he scoops them up and he runs with them because they had these big toes and they run across the lily pads. 
And the person that was reporting this on their mission trip said, it reminded me of Psalm 91.4, which says, he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. That's a God sighting. When we see something that reminds us of what God is like, Valerie and I were listening to a podcast last week, <clears throat> and it was a very difficult thing to listen to. Of course, it was one of the Jewish mothers who did not know about her son, whether he was alive or dead, because he had been taken captive. But she had talked to others who had been with him, and they had gone down into a bomb shelter to try to escape. They said in the shelter already was a Palestinian man and his family. They recognized him. They were those who were nomads that lived in that same area who were shepherds. And the others came, the terrorists came, and there were loud voices. And it was reported to this mother that this Palestinian man left the bomb shelter and went out and began to speak to these who were terrorizing. And what did he say? He said, it is my family who is in the shelter. They are all my family. Leave us alone. Unfortunately, the terrorists did not listen. But she said, just that act of humanity reminded her that God is present in the world. When we see people do amazing acts of faith, when in the midst of pain, the midst of troubles, people stand up and say, we will stand for the love and the grace of God and we will do what is right no matter what is going on around us. That is God breaking through and the kingdom breaking through into our world. And when we get to heaven, that is what it's like always. Everyone does what is right and does the best and we rejoice in God's presence because on the other side, not only is there the completeness of the presence of God, but there are the saints of God. Those who have been through the tribulation who now stand before God. Who are you going to look for first when you get to heaven? I want to see my mom and dad, my grandparents, my sister. I have friends who are on the other side. There are so many people there. And we long to see them. I often visit with folks who are nearing death. And many times they'll ask me, what is heaven like? And I'll say, well, it is glorious. I can't tell you everything there is, but I will tell you this. We will be in God's loving, gracious presence, and it will be beyond our imagination. And they'll usually ask, well, what about my family? When I see my family, I say, of course you will see your family. You see, they are there. And oftentimes these people will say, you know, I have more folks on the other side than I do on this side, and, and I'm ready. I want to see them. What's on the other side of death? God and God's gracious love and presence waiting for us and all those whom we love who have believed in Christ and gone before us. And what is it like on the other side? Well, John writes and says there's no hunger, there's no thirst or pain. I love these words. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd and he will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That is what it is like in heaven. No pain, no need, only praise of God. Have you ever finished one of those long trips? Maybe you're going on vacation and it just took you forever to pack and you couldn't get on the road and there was traffic and you finally get there and, you know, the kids, they want to go jump in the pool or go to the ocean. And what do you want to do if you 
we're the ones driving or the one that's there trying to hold all that together, navigating. You just want to go and sit <laughs> and rest. Take me out to eat tonight. I don't want to do a thing. And usually you can do that. When we get to heaven, we don't have to unpack. <laughs> we don't have to go to the grocery store and stand in line. We just get there and God says, come on. Come into my rest, my beloved child. Come and into the praise eternally. You see, not only will there not be any need, there will be something to replace it, and that is praise of God. Here again, what John hears the people saying, they say, amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to God and ever and ever, amen. Wow, that sounds like a Sandy Patty song to me. That's the kind of praise we will have. Heaven is constant praise. You know, we rarely praise God on this side. Oh, I know, every once in a while we'll, we will think of God. But when are we just overwhelmed with praise? Oh, yeah, at a football game. We see it praise an athlete, our team scores a touchdown, we jump up and down, do all kinds of stuff. But when do we actually feel that way about God? Yeah, maybe when we see a rainbow, we say, oh, that's pretty. Maybe something good happens, and we say, well, well, thank you, God. But when do we actually say, praise God for what God has done in our life? Heaven is going to be filled with praise. In 1779, a British pastor published a book of hymns. They had a lot of praises in them. They were called the Only Hymns. It became an instant bestseller in England. Everybody loved this hymn book. But like all hymn books, there are songs that just never get called on. <laughs> One of those that was ignored was number 41. It was entitled Faith's Review and Expectation. Nobody wanted to sing it. They didn't like the tune. When that hymn book made its way to America, there was a singing instructor in South Carolina, and that person took it and said, I kind of like this poem, but I think it needs a new tune. And they put it to a new tune, and they renamed it from Faith's Review and Expectation, which sounds a lot like a term paper and gave it a new title, Amazing Grace. And all of a sudden, everybody in America started singing it, became known as a spiritual national anthem. And when I think of praising God, I always think of that stanza that says, and when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. An endless cycle of praising God for what God is doing for us. So we've talked about what's on the other side. We've talked about what it's like on the other side, but how do we get to the other side? A few years ago, a woman named Beatrice Fudrick, who lives in Winnipeg, Canada, wrote her obituary before she died, and instead of writing it as most of us do, she entitled it, A Resume for Heaven. <laughs> she said, Dear Lord, please accept my application for eternal life. My resume is as follows. She put down objectives in life, her skills, her experience, references. She said that I've been a teacher. I never had students, teachers, pets. I always just helped those who were most in need. She talked about her volunteer work and retirement, knitting scarves for underprivileged children. And after all of this, she said, Lord, I hope that you will find that I have met my objectives and deserve a place in your heavenly home. You know where to find me to further discuss my qualifications. <laughs> it's cute. Beatrice sounds like a wonderful person, but she's wrong. There's no resume that will get you into heaven. If I were looking at that, I would go down to the 
reference section. I would say, well, whoever references, and if Jesus Christ were listening, that'll get you into heaven. There is absolutely nothing we can do, for we are sinners in need of God's grace. Scripture says we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We can't get there. We can't go over the gulf. It's too much. And so Jesus Christ himself died upon a cross and took our sin upon himself and forgave us and invited us to accept that love and grace. And that is how you get into heaven, my friends, is you accept that grace of God. You recognize that you are a sinner for God is the one that makes the way in Jesus. Do you hear what they're shouting in heaven? Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What we could not do for ourselves, Jesus did for us. These are the ones who have dipped their robes in the blood of the Lamb, it says. We used to sing that old hymn, Are You Washed in the Blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. That's a question that's asking us, have we given our lives to God? Jesus does what we cannot do. When I was a boy, the best restaurant in our town, you couldn't get to. Why couldn't you get to it? Because I grew up where there was an Air Force base and the best restaurant in town was the Officers Club at Warner Robins Air Force Base. And the best time to go was Friday night. It was prime rib night. And you had to get on the Air Force Base, you had to get in the Officers Club, and you had to have a reservation. We couldn't get on the Air Force Base. We were not active military, and we always wanted to go. I'd heard tales of this place. And I remember one day, Colonel Seagraves, who lived across the street from us, came over and said, how about this Friday night our family takes your family out to the O Club for prime rib. We accepted that invitation pretty quickly. <laughs> I remember walking into the Officers Club. I'd never been there, and, and it was very nice. It looked a whole lot like a country club, because that's pretty much what it was. And they greeted the colonel, and they set us at a nice big table, and they came and said, what do you want? And he just said, everybody gets prime rib. <laughs> First time I'd eaten, and it was pretty good. I remember even as a kid sitting there thinking, I couldn't get in this place on my own no matter how hard I've tried. I'm glad I knew someone who could. Now, I'm not saying Colonel C. Waves is Jesus, but he sure got us into some place we couldn't get. And none of us can get into heaven on our own. But Jesus comes and knocks at the door to our hearts and says, if you will open it, I will come in. I will save you. I will provide a way. And even if you die, you will be mine. You will come to heaven. You see, we need to let God transform us. It's not just about that initial salvation experience. We talked a lot about the other side today. But sometimes the other side breaks into this side. Sometimes we get a glimpse of heaven as John did in the Revelation. And it's to give us hope. And it's also to challenge us to live into this faith that Christ has started in us. Some years ago, I saw a picture that came across some social media somewhere, but it was from a, an article in the Washington Post. And the, the picture caught my eye because of the caption. There was a judge and a man, and they were doing something. I read the caption. It said that there was an attorney. His name was Robert Van Summeren, and he was being sworn in by Judge Michael Smith. But it wasn't that. You see that stuff in the paper all the time. It says he was being sworn in in the same courtroom where he had been convicted 20 years before. When he was 18 years old, he committed robbery. His parents had divorced the year before. He had fallen into depression, into drugs. 
And to support that drug habit, he stupidly tried to rob a bank. That did not work well. So he was convicted. And when he went to prison, he says he didn't learn much because he still wanted to just be angry at everyone. He didn't want to follow any rules, even in prison. But, but he met a friend, and the friend, he called him a legal beagle. He was the guy that, though he was in prison, helped everybody with all the legal work. He was researching how to do these things, and so he got this glimpse that maybe the other side of the law might could help him. He got out, and he went to community college, and he went on to Western Michigan University, and there he met a young woman, and they were married, and they went on to have a couple of sons, but he still would relapse because of this anger that he had. He said one day, though, he woke up and he realized he had to change his life. He had tried to get a number of jobs, but every time he had to check that, are you a convicted felon, it just kept him from getting any jobs. So he committed to go to rehab, to be sober, and when he came out, he committed to go to law school. He thought going against the law is what got me started on this. Maybe going with the law might help me. He graduated, he passed the bar exam, and he had to go before that character and fitness committee. <laughs> and he explained all that he had been through, and he said, you know, I think it might be good to have some lawyers out there like me who understand the other side of this system, who want to help folks get back on the right side of the law. They passed him, and he called the judge that sentenced him and said, you won't believe this, but I need to be sworn in. And that's how the story happened. He had another side of his life. You see, we too stand under conviction. We too have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there is another side for us. There is salvation that can bring to us a new way of looking at life. And when we begin that journey, God can begin to transform us and to use us for God's kingdom. And then one day, when our time comes, we too will pass onto the other side, and God will wipe away every tear from our eye. We come to this time of commitment and invitation. We would want all to be in heaven with us. As I've said, the way to get there is through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you've never given your life to Christ, we'd invite you to do that today. To come and let me share with you how God can save you. Perhaps you're already a Christian and you don't have a church home and you need a place to be and to grow, we would love for you to be a part of First Baptist Church. If God is leading you, would you come? But let us all sing with conviction this beautiful song of heaven.
today is the first Sunday of the month, which means it is Alms Sunday, the day we collect the offering as we leave at the doors. Ushers, if you'll have the offering plates ready at the doors, please. We need to collect our alms offering. They always wave and remind me of it, so <laughs> reminding them today. I also want to remind you that there are white roses here. These represent those whom we are honoring today on All Saints Day. If you had a loved one that we read the name of today, I'd invite you to come and take the white rose with you as remembrance today. Instead of doing a benediction like I usually do, I want y'all without the hymn books, because you know the chorus, to sing when we all get to heaven one more time. Y'all sing it like you mean it.